the spirit of truth in, in healing aim beyond individual monetary payments to collectively generate the kind of on the ground justice that actually heals across generations. Informed by human rights principles, their approach to social healing endeavors as best possible to recraft the narrative of the injustice and gender acceptance of responsibility by institutions and also very importantly governments and to repair the damage to people's physical, emotional, economic, and spiritual health, community belonging, political governance. These initiatives also seek simultaneously to erect institutional constraints to prevent it from happening again. Um, these kind of far-reaching reparative efforts, as we know, will often miss the mark. Pitfalls are everywhere. Yet sometimes they arrive home. And for many, that makes them worth the candle. Uh, the promise and challenge of this kind of approach to social healing by doing justice, conceptually and practically, is illuminated by the 10 insightful essays to be published in the Southwestern Law Review. By remarkable contributors today and to the symposium, Natsu Saito, Ruben Carranza, Rebecca Sosi, Kunihiko Yoshida, Chang Hoon Ko, Sang Su Her, Margaret Russell, Susan Serrano, Troy Andrade, Greg Robinson. Just a phenomenal group of contributors. At its core, healing the persisting wounds uplifts the imperative and urgency of US engagement with Jeju 4.3. Remaining survivors are in their 90s, though their descend descendants still await healing too. As Professor Saito describes, the book puts its foot in the justice door the United States has long tried to shut tight, trying to pry open possibilities. The Jeju 4.3 initiative started 22 years ago in South Korea, progressed, stalled, partially rejuvenated with great struggle. But it remains unfinished business because of the United States glaring refusal to engage, despite evidence of its pivotal, even albeit partial responsibility for the scorched earth carnage. The book's framework also extends beyond Jeju to encompass Native Americans, Native Hawaiians, Black Americans, Japanese Canadians, and more. And our speakers today will touch on these initiatives too. What unites all are their assessments of what works, what's failed, what's missing, and what's next for on the ground reparative efforts. For after all, that's what's important. Professor Miyoko Perez Toledo will now lay a deeper foundation for the Jeju 4.3 Social Healing Initiative with stark pictures and a video, powerful video. Uh, Miyoko is an exemplary law student. And at that time, she was an integral part of my scholar advocates team working in Jeju, along with professors Yoshida and her, at the behest of exceptional justice organizer, Professor Chang Hoon Ko, all of whom will speak today. Professor Pedro Toledo recently joined the University of Hawaii Law School faculty. So, Professor Pedro Toledo, thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to our, our colleagues in Asia. Um, I really appreciate that kind introduction, Professor Eric, and I really want to extend a heartfelt thank you for this invitation from the Southwestern Law Review, and especially to Hannah and Elena for your exceptional organizational efforts. It is an honor to be here among esteemed colleagues and distinguished scholars and advocates. Efforts by those on the front lines to bring about real enduring social healing through justice reflect extraordinary dedication and time. For Jeju communities, this has been a decades long effort. I am thankful that at their invitation, I have been able to make a modest contribution to that effort. So that the sweeping reach of Eric's book makes sense in our limited time today, let's draw from the concise account of the tragedy by Professor Kunihiko Yoshida of Hokkaido Law School, who worked with our scholar advocates team back in 2013. Professor Yoshida joins us here today and he will offer some remarks later in the program. There are many layers of complexity that the book engages, carefully citing sources, but Professor Yoshida's succinct account quoted in the book will give a big picture glimpse 
And I will intersperse some pictures visually to illustrate with the help of Hena. Thank you again. Jeju Island experienced the mass killing of some 30,000 of its 200,000 residents. These are some images from the Jeju Museum. The torture, widespread rape, and prolonged attention of many more, the destruction of at least 40,000 homes and the burning of numerous villages. Here's the words of one of the survivors about this carnage and destruction. it lies at the heart of a leading South Korean reconciliation initiative. Known as the Jeju 4.3 incident or tragedy, Jeju 4.3, because it started on April 3rd, 1948, the mass killing and destruction by South Korean military, paramilitary, and police under United States military authority and oversight was a taboo subject under South Korean national governments through the 1980s. Inspired by the democracy movement, the 2000 South Korea National Assembly legislated for Jeju 4.3 finding and reconciliation with an emphasis on the suffering of victims and their families. The resulting 2003 Korean language report of the National Committee for Investigation of the Truth about the Jeju April 3rd incident ascertained historical facts, examined responsibility, and made recommendations. Immediately after, President Ro Myung-hun visited Jeju and apologized to survivors and their families. The national government also took active steps towards social healing. But reconciliation efforts stalled after 2007. Even though the beautiful Peace Park, the inspiring memorial, as well as the informative April 3rd Museum have been established, the problem still exists. Jeju people are still hurting. Redress is very limited. Victims still can't get any reparations because of their wrongful status as the core group of communist guerrillas, how miserably they were slaughtered. And the United States secondary responsibility has not been discussed legally at depth yet, despite the fact that the US also played an important role. I went to Jeju in 2013 as part of Professor Yamamoto's team of scholar advocates, one of his three team visits there. We were there partly to gather more information and critically analyze historical accounts, including the investigation of the 4.3 National Committee, partly to speak with 4.3 survivors, teachers, community advocates, lawyers, journalists, scholars, and government officials. Sorry, can you please stop the slides? Um, about the persisting wounds, and partly to present a requested proposal for future U.S. involvement in the social healing initiative, as the U.S. had for years declined to engage. An entire day-long forum at Jeju National University was revamped from its original plan 
to focus on our team's proposal for U.S. engagement in the reparative process. A leading South Korea national television network heard about it and set up an hour-long evening news special featuring Professor Yamamoto and myself, along with Professors Yoshida and Chang Hoon Ko, who are here with us today. A leading South Korea national television, i sorry, I could see then the exceedingly strong interest in our work in Jeju and nationally, all of which became the focus of Professor Yamamoto's book and our subsequent advocacy work. We also jointly published three journal articles and the Richardson Scholar Advocates presented, can you go back a couple slides please to the group photo? One more back. Yes, there we go. The Richardson Scholar Advocates presented at formal convenings and classes in Seoul, Honolulu and Washington DC. On a subsequent visit, Professor Yamamoto and another team as American scholar lawyers presented to large audiences about vacating the wrongful mass 4.3 military commission convictions of Jeju residents 70 years earlier. Those presentations tied into the ongoing Jeju litigation. Next slide, please. And this, and Professor Yamamoto and his team became a feature story on that visit on the national nightly news, along with the 18 survivors after winning their retrials, which Professor Yamamoto can tell you more about later if there's time. One important consequence of all this was the Jeju people's request that we craft our conceptual proposal for U.S. engagement into a concrete petition seeking joint U.S., South Korea, Jeju participation at the reconciliation table. With further input from Jeju scholars and community advocates and with Richardson scholar um, and student, my classmate, Sarah Sheffield, we crafted the petition in 2014, which was translated into Korean. That translated petition garnered over 125,000 signatures in Korea and was presented to the American embassy in Seoul. And you can see Professor Cheng Hu Ko there was an integral part of that effort. The petition also garnered signatures from the United States and was the focus of a Washington DC conference drawing the attendance of international and US scholars, human rights advocates and students. The heart of all this for me though, lay beyond words or pictures or proposals or writings. Rather, it emerged from my interactions with the survivors of 4.3 atrocities and their families. Professor Cheng Hoon Ko arranged a private meeting with them on Jeju, and it was very special. It started out a bit formal with everyone a little bit nervous, but then it eased into intimate connections with guards down as though we were all part of an extended ohana or family. You can sense some of that feeling in the photo that we took at the end shown here. We asked politely if they each might share their family stories from and since 4.3, the deepest, nearly indescribable pain emerged. The Han, which is pointly described in the book, along with a wonderful human warmth and kindness and the burning desire for justice and hope for enduring healing, even six decades later. They asked for our help in telling their story of struggle, now found in healing the persisting wounds of historic injustice. That intimate human connection on Jeju, the pain, the warmth, the forward-looking desire for justice and real hope for enduring healing, affirmed in a new and profound way why I wanted to become a law professor, to train first-rate lawyers for Hawaii, and also to help empower people seeking justice for their communities locally, nationally, and even globally. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Pettit Toledo. Thank you for your contribution to this webinar and thank you for being with us today. We're extremely lucky to have you and thank you for sharing your insight and experience. Um, next, we have um, Professor Natsu Saito, who is a professor of law at Georgia State University College of Law. 
She became a distinguished university professor in 2016 and was appointed a regents professor in 2021. Her scholarship focuses on American exceptionalism and international law, the legal history of race in the United States, the plenary power doctrine as, a, as applied to immigrants, American Indians, and US territorial possessions, and the human rights implications of the US government policies, particularly about suppression of political dissent. Professor Saito, we're happy to have you. Thank you so much. It's really an honor to be part of this symposium on such an important topic and to celebrate yet another accomplishment of one of the most incredible scholar activists of our generation. I really appreciate and I'm humbled by the opportunity to join you from Atlanta, where I live and work on lands from which the Muscogee Creek Nation was violently removed in a city that was made rich and powerful by enslaved as well as convict labor. I mention this because I think it's always important to know where we are, to appreciate the history and spirits that surround us. But I also start here because today we're honoring the people of Jeju Island and acknowledging their violent dispossession at the hands of the United States, among other colonial powers. Our histories are integrally linked, not least because the United States' ability to direct so much of the tragedy associated with Jeju 4.3 and to continue denying its role derives directly from the ongoing occupation, expropriation, and exploitation of the lands and peoples of North America. Reparative justice has been a persistent theme of Professor Yamamoto's powerful and deeply insightful human rights work. Healing the persisting wounds of historic injustice provides a practical application of the reparations framework he has developed over many years to the atrocities that took place on Jeju Island. But its impact reaches far beyond Jeju, and today I'd like to highlight two dimensions of that reach. The first is that healing the persisting wounds illustrates the significance of truth, healing, and empowerment in any movement for redress. These are themes that Professor Yamamoto has touched on already, and I'd like to just say a few more words about them. We live in a time when historical truths are being intensely contested. And with this work, Professor Yamamoto illustrates the importance of how one casts a narrative and how the failure to acknowledge significant injustices leads to long-lasting transgenerational harm. But truth alone doesn't heal. It has to be part of a process in which material and moral damage is rectified and reassurance provided that similar violations will not recur. Professor Yamamoto's work demonstrates that social healing will require a multidimensional approach that restores dignity and well-being when built upon the foundational concepts of recognition responsibility, reconstruction, and reparation. And this is particularly important these days when reparations are again being discussed, not only anymore, but often still in terms of financial compensation. Finally, Professor Yamamoto helps us appreciate that even as we hold those wielding power accountable, the most important thing may not be what we can get the government to do. It may be ensuring that the communities at issue are empowered. And in this case, that means recognizing the right that has been denied Jeju Islanders for so long, their right to self-determination. But what will probably stay with me the longest is not Professor Yamamoto's brilliant framing of the remedial process most appropriate to the Jeju 4.3 tragedy, but his framing of the problem in terms of Han, which Miyoko just referenced. And this is the second point I'd like to make. I understand Han to be an elusive concept that can't be properly translated into English, a term that reflects the hardship suffered by Korean people, particularly at the hands of their colonizers over many generations. Theologian Nam Dong Su was a political dissident imprisoned and tortured for his opposition to the US backed regime in South Korea. He describes Han in the book as a feeling of unresolved resentment against injustices suffered, a sense of helplessness because of the overwhelming odds against one, a feeling of acute pain in one guts and bowels that results in an obstinate urge to take revenge and to right the wrong. 
I don't expect to understand all that is encompassed within this uniquely Korean concept, but haven't we all seen such processes at work where wrongs remain unacknowledged and unresolved, producing intense feelings of both helplessness and acute pain, and how when such deep wounds remain open, the anger and despair they generate persist from generation to generation. These cycles persist resonating throughout any society that is built on unacknowledged violence and trauma. And that's why we all need to take reparations seriously and why I think this work of Professor Yamamoto's is such a gift to us. In addition to making Jeju Island's history real to us and providing a very practical path for addressing the wrongs at issue, healing the persisting wounds exposes the sources of the anger and despair we see around us today, as well as the common roots of many of our wounds. It confirms that accountability is essential, but affirms simultaneously that we can't wait for the responsible parties to act. Instead, it places the communities most directly impacted at the heart of the struggle for reparations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Saito. We are lucky to have you and thank you for sharing your insight and experience. Indeed, Professor Yamamoto's work is a gift to us all. Um, next, we have, um, next we will move to um, more of a general um, speakers web, um, portion when our speakers will actually share part of their um, insights and part of their research and contributions that will be published in our uh, upcoming symposium. We have uh, with us next Professor Chang Kung Ko, and he's joining us directly from Jeju. Uh, professor Ko is a professor at Jeju National University, and he can be aptly described as an international powerful peace advocate. Professor Ko is the leader and organizing, uh, organizer of Jeju as a world peace island movement, and he's also the president of the World Association of Island Studies since November 1997. Thank you, Professor Ko. We're lucky to have you here with us today. Uh, thank you, everybody. And so I just talk about uh, Jeju Peace Island principles uh, through around uh, 30, uh, 30 years uh, movement. And I, I would like to talk to this uh, Korea Jeju 0.3 Human Rights Act 2023 and, uh, will become peace building bridges between America and Korea. And the title is uh, just and uh, Korean in Korea, Korean people and uh, just uh, started uh, to make uh, the redress to the victims. And so, and uh, my type, my topic is going to uh, cross the sea, United States. We can just uh, uh, want to uh, uh, Korea to human right act like this. Uh, <clears throat> so and uh, this work and. Uh, and uh, uh, my students, three students joined this uh, pro, uh, pro project. And so, and uh, you look at uh, my uh, uh, photograph, and uh, just uh, adding uh, one more and two, two law schools and uh, uh, visited the Jeju National University on uh, October 10, 2018. You look at that. Uh, so they just, uh, uh, studied together and a Jeju uh, National University student and a Hawaii Law School student and uh, just uh, talking about the uh, reparation process of Jeju uh, of Hope Point City Trilogy at the grassroots levels or next. And so, and uh, just in a, in, we, uh, I look at an uh, Summary and around the you know, 15 years and you know, effort, and the human rights movement of Jeju National University. And the, at the eighth Peace Island Forum, began a discussion of United States responsibility for 4.3. And at the time, and, at the, and, and then firstly, I met, I, I met you know, Professor Kuniko Yoshida you know, in 2009. And so, in just look at uh, 2014, and you know, we just uh, uh, 2013, and uh, uh, Professor Erin Yamamoto, and uh, so Professor Miyoko Putit and Jeju, 
And so we just talk about who joined to South Korea and United States. The whole point is insert task force for further implement recommendation and foster comprehensive and enduring social healing through justice. And I'll just we we'll just keep on going and until in 2000, uh, the March of 2015, we, we, we went to Washington, D.C. And so just now we are in 2020, and a declaration of a movement in a signature movement. And uh, so for the enactment of Korea J.J. 4.3, Human Rights Act 2024. And uh, also, also uh, and then we also visited, uh, in two, especially 2019, and 2018, we just uh, in 2018 and Chicago and April Chicago conference, the University of Chicago whole point three conference, and uh, 2019 and uh, Washington DC and Philadelphia University UPenn and uh, we have a conference whole uh, point three healing conference, and uh, just uh, just now and uh, Jeju uh, Jeju. Uh, pupils and uh, just resolve at the uh, domestic and in Korea. And so we, they want another uh, healings in the United States. That's a uh, main, po main, <coughs> main point of uh, this, the human rights movement. Okay, next. And uh, especially I just introduced and uh, last year and uh, September 6, 2024, and a uh, social healing and a uh, uh, conference through online. And, and you look at an uh, every now of the, at the screens. And so we look at uh, three, whole point to three victims to uh, speech. And uh, just, just mic, uh, uh, taking mic person, which is the ones we call of Bukchon families, Bukchon villages, and one of victim. And another person, Mr. Izeon, 93 years old. And uh, another female, and, uh, whole point is survivors, He Chun Oh, 93 years old. She went to UNESCO at the testimony on November 26th, uh, 2021. It is so, so impressive. And uh, she is one diver also. And she is uh, also whole point uh, uh, three survivors. And so we have a conversation. We have a how to uh, reconciliation together uh, and, uh, through, through an online and uh, at the real situation. And the uh, next, next. And I also, I just introduced you know, we April 2018. We April, uh, April 19, we visited the uh, United States Congressman Mark Dacon of California, and and then and Judy Chu's office also, and uh, by a uh, great student and by groups and a Catholic uh, priest and uh, two whole point three uh, victims, you know, female Hong Chun Ho and also Ko Wan Sun. We just discuss about how to resolve, how to healing, how to social healing of Jeju tragedy at the Congress level and the United States and the capital. And so that's a big issues. So that's a, and a, how to link to each other, how to keep and Jeju peace island principle, principles. And so we can just, we need and some kind of healings and uh, in order to, to do it, we need uh, some kind of uh, to enactment of a whole point, Jeju, Korea Jeju whole point three Human Rights Act and a uh, different from uh, Hong Kong Human Rights Act in uh, uh, 2019. And so that's the, <clears throat> that's the main point and so uh, uh, to the, uh, the, we just uh, uh, ex uh, expect a uh, good result of uh, November election in the United States, and uh, we can put, uh, we can improve our social healing uh, 
movement, also you know, Jeju Peace Island uh, movement. You know, we all every time Korean uh, Jeju Korean Jeju people uh, want to keep Jeju Peace Island principles. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Professor Ko. Thank you so much for being here with us today from Jeju. And thank you for your incredible contribution and for your work and for advancing the um, social healing justice framework, not only in your, not only on Jeju, but throughout the world. Uh, next, we have Mr. Ruben Carranza. Mr. Carranza is, works as a senior expert at the International Center for Transitional Justice. He currently works with victims, communities, and reparation policy make makers in Nepal. Indonesia, the Philippines, Iraq, Palestine, Liberia, Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, and many more. His research focuses on transitional justice, corruption, and economic crimes. Welcome, welcome, Mr. Carranza. Thank you very much. And um, I'm very honored to be here to speak with, with you. Um, I'll try to make this brief. I'll read the first paragraph of the essay that I have contributed to this symposium uh, as a response to Professor Yamamoto's excellent book. In the field of transitional justice, South Korea stands out as a helpful paradox. It is a good example of how political will and public pressure have made possible a transitional justice process that includes at least 10 truth commissions, the prosecution of former military dictators, and the offer of apologies and reparations at the domestic level. But this is also the same South Korean society that made these transitional justice measures happen that maintains a military alliance with the imperial power that armed and backed those Korean ex-dictators and took part in wartime massacres of Koreans in Jeju while casting itself as their ally. In 2019, I was a participant at the United Nations event commemorating Jeju 4.3. There were historians, human rights advocates like me, and Jeju civil society leaders there. But the most important person, in my opinion, who spoke there was Ko Wan Soon. And I can't forget her words. She said, I was an eight-year-old girl who has become an 80-year-old woman who still has not achieved her dream that the U.S. government join us and help us discover the truth about Jeju. Her wish should be the minimum demand from Jeju. Will it happen? In 2017, ICTJ organized its annual transitional justice lecture on the theme of racial injustice and transitional justice in America. And one of the speakers was Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation and, and an African-American activist. He said what to me is an important and very sobering point about American willingness to tell and accept the truth. Darren Walker said, and I quote, our exceptionalism impairs our capacity for truth telling. And yet this month, together with a colleague in ICTJ, I testified virtually at a public hearing in Los Angeles, close to Southwestern Law School, organized by the Reparations Task Force for the State of California. And I discussed ways that California can provide reparations for either the descendants of slaves or more generally for African-Americans impacted by slavery. So it is possible. In my essay, I pointed to what I think is an indispensable condition for the United States to join South Korea in a truth telling process involving Jeju 4.3. And Professor Yamamoto in fact quotes me in his book, he said, Robert Carranza has said that the United States would not participate in a joint US-South Korea truth-seeking process unless South Korea links that participation to US national security interests or the American populace pressures its government to acknowledge that it enabled human rights violations abroad. In my essay, I also mention in detail four three or four examples that Jeju survivors can use in campaigning for reparations. I mentioned the assistance programs that the US has funded. These are not reparations programs, but only assistance programs for victims in Vietnam of the use of Agent Orange by the United States during the Vietnam War. 
Some will mention reparations given by the U.S. for Japanese Americans incarcerated in World War II. And that is an example that can be studied, although it's important to note that those reparations were given 35 years after the end of World War II, unlike in Germany, which opened reparations just five years after the end of World War II. An example I also mentioned is the reparations obtained by survivors of torture in Kenya uh, committed by British colonial forces. They found through a British historian records of their torture in UK archives, sued the United Kingdom, and ICTJ helped them obtain a settlement that funded reparations and a memorial in Nairobi. A final point I will make is on ideology, Jeju, and transitional justice. Again, let me read uh, this paragraph from my essay. Those seeking recognition for Jeju 4.3 victims occasionally, though unintentionally, adopt a defensive tone whenever the ideological beliefs and political affiliations of some or many of those victims are mentioned. For example, Professor Yamamoto refers to the need for a definitive rejection of the Island of Red's branding and generation of an accurate depiction of Jeju 4.3 people and communities as one of the goals of obtaining an apology from the United, from the United States. I then mentioned the example of Peru, where the Truth Commission had recommended reparations for everyone uh, whose human rights were violated during the Peruvian war covered by the Truth Commission, uh, but it excluded Marxist-Leninists from uh, reparations because of their ideology. And so it's important to me that this goal is, uh, is also uh, addressed in seeking an apology and in obtaining reparations for Jeju victims. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carranza, and thank you for joining us today in this discussion. And also thank you for your efforts and your tremendous work that you do nationally and on the international circuit. Um, next, we uh, Professor Rebecca Tsosi is joining us in this discussion. Professor Tsosi, uh, Professor, I apologize, I'm gonna revert back. We have Professor Seng Su Hur, uh, who is joining us from Korea. Professor Hur is a former professor at Seng um, Hu University and is also a member of the uh, Korea Social Science Institute. Professor Hur serves on the Korea, uh, Korea's Presidential Committee of Policy Planning. And welcome, Professor Hur. We're happy to have you today. Uh, I thank you very much. I am very honored here with you. My name is Ho Sang Su. I was professor of Sangong University and now uh, president of Korean Social Science Association. Uh, Professor Eric Yamamoto reminded me of the importance and value of human rights law and made me realize the hope and the vision to solve the long-term conflict. His new book is uh, making a very important contribution. Today, I would like to refer to the American paradox of uh, some act and omission committed by American in United States military deployed in South Korea from September 1945 to June 1949, very shortly. As you know, by winning World War II, the United States took over South Korea. United States took over and directly controlled Japan, which was a hostile country, while it took over and directly controlled South Korea, which was a Japanese colony. And the United States Army Force took the lead in introducing religious freedom, democracy, human rights, and a free market economy to South Korea. And uh, uh, following the occupation and uh, direct control of uh, South Korea, the United States Army military imposed very harsh iron blooded rule. The United States military government took over the 
lead in suppressing democratic and progressive group in South Korea by reusing Japanese police from Korea. Further, the US military government has focused on discriminating, excluding, and eliminating so-called communists. In this regard, I would like to very Professor Her, I believe you muted yourself. Professor Ho, sorry, I'm not hearing you. We will ask Stephen, if possible, to um, manually unmute Professor Her. Yeah, Elaine, I'm trying to unmute him on my Thank end. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Professor Ho, no voice, no voice. While Stephen is trying to um, to unmute Professor, oh, yeah, there yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. The issue was whether the United States occupation of South Korea was justified on the international law. Did the United States military view the Korean Peninsula as an occupied area, or was it seen as a liberated area? The United States included the Korean Peninsula in the category of occupied territory, even though it should have clearly stated through the Cairo Declaration that Korea should be treated separately as a liberated area. But the United States did not even distinguish between the occupied and liberated area of the Korean Peninsula. And uh, I would like to, another issue is uh, <clears throat> the Korean army and the national police under the operational control by United States military advisor burned the village and took their precious lives, accusing them of being communist, insurgent, and rioters. The involvement of United States military government in the context and the development of all of these events is so obvious that the key role of the United States is to directly exercise very important guidance, command, supervisor, and operational control. The United States military government has already dispatched land police to Jeju Island since the end of February 1947. Captain Patridge of United States military government was dispatched to the scene of the Gwandokjong massacre. And uh, I would like uh, the, the dispatch of uh, Major General Orland Ward. Major, Orland, Major General Orland Ward, command of United States Army's 6th Division under the United States Army Force in Korea. Headquarter ordered Col Colonel Brown, commander of Tennis Regiment, to call the unrest in Jeju at that time. Colonel Brown commanded and supervised all military and police force, including United States Army, regular army, as well as national 
constabulary, the Coast Guard, and the Joint Inquiry Team. The order of Major General Orlando Ward, 6th Division Commander of the United States Army, took over the order of Lieutenant General Haji, Commander of United States Army Post in Korea. Lieutenant General Haji's order was in accordance with the direction of Supreme Commander for Allied Power, Douglas Megard in Tokyo. General Megard carried out the order of President Truman in Washington, D.C. Therefore, the United States government, the United States Army, and the local commander are responsible for the massacre in tens of thousands of unarmed civilians in Jeju. Thank you for your patience. Thank you, Professor Her, and thank you for joining us today. And thank you again for your incredible work that you do. And thank you for contributing to our um, paper issue symposium as well. Um, next, we have Rebecca Tosi. Um, I try to introduce her a little too early, but Professor Tosi, we're so happy you're joining us in this discussion today. Professor Tosi is a Regents Professor at the James E. Rogers College of Law at the University of Arizona. Professor Tosi is widely known for her work in the fields of federal Indian law and indigenous people's human rights. Welcome, Professor Tosi. Thank you, Elena. I want to thank the um, Southwestern Law School and most particularly you and Hannah for being such amazing students slash colleagues. You guys set the standard for professionalism, and it is a great honor to be here today to commemorate the work of my very esteemed friend and colleague, Professor Eric Yamamoto. I first started thinking about these things a long time ago before people were even talking about reconciliation as a healing type of a thing. It was always that kind of tort reparations, very hard line, punitive, retributive justice, let's get some justice for what's done. And he brought such an elegant voice in his work about healing that I was very powerfully influenced in my own work on behalf of Native people, and by that I mean inclusively the indigenous peoples um, that, that belong to these lands. And thank you to Professor Saito for locating yourself. I am speaking to you today um, from the lands of the um, Autumn people, the Akima Autumn people who are near Phoenix, but Salt River Reservation. So that's where I'm at right now. Um, and I just, I feel that we are at a certain moment and I'm gonna take just a few minutes in the time that I have to commend um, Professor Yamamoto and the um, symposium organizers for bringing us all together across those kind of group identities that sometimes can divide us because we're lobbying Congress for some particular thing for you know our people. And we forget about the deeper connections. And so this whole idea that Professor Yamamoto posits in terms of um, healing persistent wounds of injustice to me resonates because it is a collective responsibility that, that we have as much of an obligation to name and to frame and to participate in as those with whom we have to correspond about the past and about the present on these conditions of justice or injustice as the case may be. So it's it's a huge undertaking. I think the collective voice is very important. And that acknowledgement that once this um, terrible harm happens and my heart goes out to everybody who was affected by this Jeju 4.3 tragedy, I honestly admit I did not know of it before Eric sent me the book and I, I couldn't believe that I didn't know about it. I, I just couldn't believe I didn't know about it. So for those of you that have spent your careers working on this on behalf of the people, I commend you. My heart goes out to everybody who was touched by this tragedy. And I think that that is also the sense that we feel as Native people because 
there are these these complex interactions with the US government who has assumed a trust responsibility for native people in the United States how can your trustee do things to you that are genocide physical genocide cultural genocide and then act in a form of denial as if that was for your own good and that is the, the quandary of being in that position of dealing with historic, quote unquote, injustice in a contemporary frame. So my contribution to the symposium dealt with um, the boarding schools for Indigenous peoples. And in Canada and the United States, there was a big critical moment, right? Last summer, there was that explosive news story about the the victims, these child victims that had been uncovered in these unmarked graves, 215 Indigenous children in Canada, and that thrust into Canada's vision, what had been in their national vision as a result of the Truth and Reconciliation movement that culminated in a 2015 report that acknowledged this, the stories were told, and in fact, material amends were paid to an extent, but what was not as obvious was how that had affected the families who lost children who never came home. What happened to those children? Oh, they ran away. That was the common refrain in the US and Canada. They ran away. We don't know what happened to them. No, many of them did not run away. They died and they were buried or burned and incinerated. So it is that past, which is a very difficult past that was resurrected. And Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, who is herself um, a native person, member of Laguna Pueblo, as well as Secretary of the Interior, ordered a report. And that report was released in May of 2022 with a government entity acknowledging the extreme harms of the Indian boarding school system and documenting that the appropriation of Native children from their families was forcible all the way up to 1969. 1819 to 1969, forcible. Nobody had a choice in that. So how could that history be disregarded? And here the contemporary part of what Professor Yamamoto is saying this is an unbroken continuum of harms. Today, we frame them as educational disparities, that Native students are underperforming even in state schools. We look at the foster care system where Native children are also appropriated into state care away from their families. And the Brackeen case dealing with the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is a form of reparative justice, is going to be heard by the Supreme Court on the 9th. The United States is committed to its identity as this pluralistic democracy in which things like this don't happen to its citizens, but they do. They are happening. And so how do we how do we demand accountability for that? And, and Professor Yamamoto, you have such an expansive framework for this. I have never seen anybody deal at the level of detail with what must happen for this process of healing to happen. But what I want to commend to the audience is that what we are characterizing, and, and he characterizes sort of in terms of the four, you know, R's of recognition and responsibility and reconstruct, reconstruction and reparation, what that really is is a process in which those stories are told because the stories have the agency, the stories sit with the people, the stories are the people who can't have that voice today through their descendants and through those like you that represent those voices. That is an extremely powerful thing. And now that we have government reports that document this, can we get further down that process? And that's the question raised by a congressional bill that hasn't been enacted yet, which would actually create a commission to look at the boarding school situation and to even subpoena federal officials and materials that currently are not available to see what exactly has happened and what is in our historic archive. So that process of tr truth telling is very, very important. The second theme that I think really emerges is that when Professor Yamamoto, you talk about material and emotional 
parts of that process is coming together. Native um, traditions, justice traditions talk about that healing process of, you know, when some, you know, situation happens where you harm another person, you know, you have to set that right. That is a spiritual way of taking accountability. And once emotions are truly part of that, can the United States as a nation do that? And I think we did have that moment following George Floyd's murder, where much of the nation was in emotional angst. Unfortunately, the, that moment was short-lived politically, but it must be carried forward. And I think you point that through very, very well. And I know that I, I am out of time, but the last thing I want to say is that the United States will say, we have done what we could to be accountable. We gave compensation for lands in the Indian Claims Commission Act. We have NAGPRA, the Native American Race Protection and Repatriation Act to restore remains. We have ICWA, the Child Welfare Act. Yes, those are moments in time where Congress has committed itself. But let's look at that all together. We are talking about the people. We are talking about our ancestors in place over time, never moved. The children, the future generations, all of us today have this present moment where we can take accountability for ourselves and for those that are part of this larger cycle of justice. So Professor Yamamoto, my heartfelt thanks for your beautiful work. You are my hero in so many ways. And to all of my colleagues on this program, thank you again for being here today and for the great work that you're doing. Thank you so much, Professor Tosi. Thank you for your amazing presentation. And I'm sure you've touched, you've touched my heart and I'm sure you've touched the heart of everyone present. Um, on this call today, and you continue to touch everyone's hearts through your work, through your incredible work. Thank you so much for joining us. Next, we have Professor Margaret Russell. Professor Russell is a professor of law at Santa Clara University School of Law, and is also an elected member of the American Law, um, American law Institute. She's also a Fulbright um, research scholar for her work with women judges in Tanzania. She serves as a member of the California Truth and Healing Council that works cl closely with um, California Native American tribes to accurately represent um, the diversity of experience of all Native American tribes within the state of California. Welcome, Professor Russell. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I do want to um, just uh, correct at the outset, I'm not uh, a member of the California Truth and Healing Council any more than say the, the public that is invited to participate in the work. Um, and I just wanna make that distinction because um, the California Truth and Healing Council was set up by an executive order of the governor and, and um, so much wonderful work is being done there. But I have been um, very interested in this work, uh, which has to do with um, Native Americans and, uh, and the state of California as it was formed. The state of California, as many of you may know, um, what was, it was not just the gold rush and suddenly <laughs> there was a state. Um, it really relied on the extermination, uh, the genocide, as Rebecca said, um, of Indians, of Native Americans. And although my past work and the work that um, I've talked a lot with Professor Yamamoto with has to do with historical injustice in the context of African Americans and reparative justice. Uh, I was asked by my own university, Santa Clara University, um, to sit on a working group that essentially would look at the land that, and the history um, of the mission that is one of the Spanish missions that is um, the root of our university and to start telling the truth. Um, and it was a wonderful experience. And as a result of working on that with historians and anthropologists and uh, members of the Ohlone and Mwekma Ohlone community and students, um, I became very interested in the healing process in California because this is a, a, this is a genocide. And only now um, is that word, which has very uh, great historical and legal specificity, only now is it being rightly applied um, by some of the top officials. Governor Gavin Newsom, as, as Eric Yamamoto mentioned, 
um, issued an apology. He's the governor of California. In 2019, he, uh, he had a public news conference and meeting with uh, members of various Native American tribes in California and did what I think is so important in thinking about Eric Yamamoto's work and framework of recognition, responsibility, reconstruction, reparation. And, and I, I think the brilliance of Professor Yamamoto's work is that it provides this analytical framework to help dig into uh, difficult issues. And perhaps unknowingly, or perhaps Professor Yamamoto as a student who works for Governor Newsom, but he stepped forward and gave an apology. And it, uh, it was great because he said, I'm a fifth generation Californian and I am ashamed of what I didn't know before this. And that was in 2019, the executive order that was issued in conjunction with that um, set up a California Truth and Healing Council, which is native voices um, uh, coming forward to go through these steps to tell the truth um, that, that so many Native Americans know of, of the origins of California, the sort of the, the origin story that is, is very false the way we've learned it. And then to recommend ways for the government and others, other stakeholders to take responsibility to reconstruct and to repair. So, um, so many of these themes have been raised by other speakers and I really appreciate that. I think I'm going to pull out um, a little bit more the thread of the wound and the healing. And in a lot of ways I see Professor Yamamoto's framework, four part framework can be distilled into, you know, let's tell the truth about the wound and let's talk about what healing really means. So to start that, let me just briefly read from one of my greatest sources of understanding injustice. And um, that is poetry and fiction. And uh, I think the quote, persisting wounds of historic injustice that Professor Yamamoto refers to um, can be found in strong theme in the work of contemporary Native American writers, uh, such as poet laureate Joy Harjo, Therese Marie Mayo, Louise Erdrich, and someone I had the um, great honor of interviewing a couple of years ago when his novel came out, Tommy Orange, who wrote a um, really a remarkable novel set in the current day in Oakland, California, which is where I live, that talks about the urban experiences today of Native Americans. Um, and the, the quote that really struck me when I think about Eric's work about talking about healing the his persistent wounds of historic injustice is um, spoken by an invisible narrator in Tommy Orange's book. So I'll just read a little bit of it. Uh, that narrative character says, the wound that was made when white people came and took all that they took has never healed. An unattended wound gets infected, becomes a new kind of wound, like the history of what actually happened became a new kind of history. All these stories that we haven't been telling all this time, that we haven't been listening to, are just part of what we need to heal. Not that we're broken and don't make the mistake of calling us resilient. To not have been destroyed, to not have given up, to have survived is no badge of honor. Would you call an attempted murder victim resilient? Um, that says so much, I think, in that, that fictional passage. And what the California Truth and Healing Council is that was set up through this executive order is, is trying um, to have a, a open uh, meetings, the, and these are the ones that I've been attending during COVID online um, and hope to in person. And then it sets up partnerships, um, which I do hope to be uh, part of, academic partnerships and others, so that solutions can be talked about. Um, the California Truth and Healing Council has already laid a lot of groundwork for transformative change since its inception three years ago. The important thing to remember is that Native American voices lead the way in articulating the problems, proposing solutions in areas such as education, cultural revival, criminal justice, restoration of indigenous land and water rights. 
an increasingly common topic is reparations in the form of land. And, and um, Professor Saito uh, and uh, others, thank you for bringing up uh, land acknowledgement because I think what people who use land acknowledgements now are sort of moving on and progressing to is, okay, we're acknowledging this land. What does that mean? What, what are the implications of that? And uh, one member of the council commented, this is all stolen land. We are landless Indians in our own territory. The only compensation for land is land. So since, since 2019, the state has taken several steps, California, consistent with a growing land back movement to return Native American homelands to the descendants of those who lived there before Europeans arrived. In March of this year, the governor proposed giving California's indigenous nations $100 million for the purchase and preservation of their ancestral land. Um, now I'm not, this is not a glorification of, of the governor, although I think he deserves a lot of kudos because there is controversy even about that, about the pace of it, about the depth of it. Um, but the fact that it is, happen is happening is remarkable. In September, um, of this year. Native American leaders from throughout the state joined the governor to commemorate the signing of three landmark bills. AB 1314, establishing a statewide emergency alert system for missing Native people. That is a huge problem, especially missing Native women. Um, Deb Haland, uh, the cabinet secretary on the national level, has devoted a lot of attention to that too. Uh, AB State Bill 1936 removes the name of the surname of Saranus Hastings from UC Hastings College of the Law and advances restorative justice efforts for Native Americans who suffered mass killings orchestrated by Mr. Hastings. AB 2022 removes the racist and sexist word SQUAW from all geographic features and place names in California and not a native Californian, but as someone who, you know, as a new Californian was taken to ski resorts, et cetera, in Lake Tahoe, the, that word, that racist is Texas word has only very recently been recognized in the mainstream as being racist and sexist. Um, so these accomplishments are, are certainly not the work of, of one governor or a handful of legislators. They're driven by native voices. They're the results of um, myriad tribes and voices throughout the state who are determined to identify the historical wounds and to insist on government actions to help heal them. Again, we're talking about the kind of historical wounds that I think Eric Yamamoto has so helpfully provided a framework for analyzing and actually moving forward con concretely. Um, the word Han, H-A-N, that has been discussed earlier as that sense of many things, including the wound that, that doesn't heal, right? The generational trauma that results is, is very familiar to me as partly African-American in the African-American experience, but also in the work that I've done about you know, African-American reparations. So reading about Jeju and learning, I too, for the first time, learned a great deal about this has really helped me um, structure the way that I will continue to work in this area. And by elevating the Native voices, Native American voices and experiences, <coughs> excuse me, I think the work of this California Truth and Healing Council has great potential to, to light um, the persisting wounds of historic injustice and fight them. Only by attending to these wounds can we begin to move forward um, with annual statements from the council and then a, a final report in 2025 with specific recommendations. I'm very hopeful uh, in working with them that, um, that we will have some success. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Russell, and thank you for joining us today, and thank you for being an inspiration to us all. Um, next, we have Kunihiko Yoshida. Um, he's a professor of law at Hokkaido University in Japan. He's a 
recognized international expert of reparations who has written over 100 articles and case reports and has published seven monographs. Welcome, Professor Ishida. Thank you very much for this occasion. Um, uh, and con congratu congratulations, Eric, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, publication of your nice uh, monograph. And I'll share my slides, okay? Yeah, I'm today. Um, I'm joining uh, this wonderful online uh, symposium uh, from Paris. Uh, um, uh, it's uh, right now almost eleven p.m. Uh, here, and uh, uh, the the supposed to be a uh, Jeju. Uh, conference at UNESCO. I'm now uh, staying in a tiny hotel in the vicinity of a UNESCO headquarter building, but uh, it has been canceled all of a sudden at the last minute. And uh, But uh, uh, with uh, my non-refundable tickets, I, I have to be here. But anyway, um, I, I talk about the reasons uh, uh, for its can cancellation, and uh, uh, it's uh, debatable. And this is, as you know, the the uh, flags uh, surrounding uh, UNESCO headquarter building. And instead, I meet with uh, uh, this woman uh, to talk about the uh, indigenous language uh, issues. And uh, as many of you know, the the indigenous language decade uh, has started this year. And I'm uh, working on the Ainu. Uh, people uh, from civil perspective compared to indigenous people across the world. So uh, I have been to uh, Kenya, Brazil, Sweden, uh, Australia uh, within the last several months to meet with indigenous peoples uh, each place. So as introduction, the uh, Pro Professor Ko, uh, uh, established uh, about a decade ago, the uh, Peace Islands Network organization connecting Jeju, Hokkaido, Hawaii, Ryukyu, and so on. And I'm, I've added from indigenous perspective, uh, from their kind of uh, marginalized perspective, Jeju Island is also uh, indigenous people. Uh, uh, they have an independent nation to the 15th century. But looking back uh, the past decade, my contributions have been insufficient, very limited. And uh, redress uh, requires the combined efforts of generations, I think. And our joint efforts for reparations and reconciliation uh, in the context of many tragic cases of the past must be meaningful and, mu and must continue, especially in the light of vicious cycle of hatreds exemplified by the Ukraine war and other ubiquitous contestations. My, I, I myself uh, encountered uh, with this shocking, horrible tragedy in Jeju in early 2000s. And I met with Professor Ko for the first time in September 2009, as he stated. And uh, together with Professor Yamamoto, uh, we. Uh, I visited, we, I revisited uh, in the summer of 2012 for uh, Professor Yamamoto's first time. And uh, uh, he was, as all of you know, he was a very sincere scholar and he strongly felt obligated to do something. And he already translated a thick official report of uh, uh, April 3rd incident. Uh, Korean book uh, in the following year. And now we have his uh, thick uh, monograph uh, about this issue. And I myself have felt compelled to take action and discover a solution, but in vain. Looking back at the 2010s, I suspect the move towards reconciliation has been mired in the deadlock of stagnation. In this pessimistic mood for me, 
uh, Professor Yamamoto's resilience is impressive. Uh, he has expressed a more optimistic perspective, noting that uh, social healing has been re re rejuvenated. But on the other hand, it seems to me with regard to Jeju issues, there are numerous obstacles, challenges, and uh, examples of unfinished business for us to pursue and learn from uh, in the social healing process. This is uh, the picture taken when Professor Yamamoto uh, visited Jeju uh, for his first time uh, almost a decade ago. The reason uh, some people might uh, question, the, might ask me, why uh, I, uh, Kenny, as even though I'm a Japanese legal scholar, have been involved in this Korean issues. Uh, there are several reasons. First, there's an affinity between two islands, I mean, Hokkaido and uh, uh, Jeju. Hokkaido, until the Meiji Restoration more than 100 years ago, the na nation of uh, Ainu people, as you know. And although both are today uh, regarded uh, resort islands, they were once islands of tragedies. During World War II, 58 out of, out of 135 Chinese slave labor sites loc uh, located in Hokkaido, while 150,000 Korean slave laborers were allegedly deported from the Korean Peninsula to Hokkaido. Uh, uh, and currently, uh, there are less than 6,000 ethnic Koreans uh, living in Hokkaido, though. From the, on the other hand, from the late 1940s, Chej had its own uh, horrible tragedy where many of its re residents fell prey to mass killing. So in this sense, both islands are now in dire need of reparations and reconciliation. This is a picture uh, of my uh, campus in wintertime, but few students know the, our campus was established uh, after the conquest of uh, Ainu people. This campus used to be the Ainu village, but they were ousted. And then our, um, our campus was established. And this is a be beautiful picture of Jeju uh, Airport, but very few people know so many remains of victims of Jeju mass killings uh, excavated even until uh, 2010s. This is uh, uh, exhibits of excavation in the Jeju airport. Second, the, the strong relationship between uh, Osaka area, the Western Japan and Jeju. Currently uh, about one fourth of resident Korean in the uh, Osaka region, that is the biggest in Japan, is uh, are from Jeju. This astonishingly high rate is contrasted by the fact that Jeju's population less than 1% of the population of Korea. Many of these Korean expatriates are subject to racial discrimination in Japanese society. The Jeju issue is thus one of Japanese, the problems of Japanese society itself. The high rate of Jeju Islands in Japan uh, is uh, uh, due to uh, partially, due to partly due to the regular ferry boat running between uh, Osaka and Jeju. It's called Kundegan in Korean language, Kimigayomaru in Japanese. Uh, this is it. And uh, uh, prominent. Uh, uh, Resident scholar such as uh, uh, Xi Jong Kim, uh, the famous uh, poet, he himself narrowly escaped uh, from the Jeju tragedy in 1949. And uh, uh, Dong Il Kim, uh, she's also uh, running a, a pop and uh, mom, uh, mom and pop bento shop in Tokyo until recently, until she passed on, but uh, uh, she has never been classified. Uh, she has uh, uh, not get 
uh, 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 the honor redemption uh, never. Uh, and this is the truth. And the third, the manner uh, in which Jeju Islanders were killed, uh, slaughtered by Korean uh, right wing group, uh, and uh, the way uh, of uh, the Nanjin uh, massacre was perpetrated by, by Japanese army because uh, many Korean uh, people used to be during World War II a Japanese soldier. The number of victims in Jeju itself, which actually ranges from 30,000 to 80,000, that's shocking. Uh, even though, according to the official report, the figure was around 30,000, but according to the prominent uh, resident Korean in Japan, the figure is much more, much higher. And uh, the one of the most famous uh, scholar on this issue, is, uh, Bruce Cumming, uh, agreed with the statement at the UN JJ conference in uh, 2019. Uh, responding to my question there. Fourth, the research on this uh, uh, tragedy started earlier in Japan in late 1970s and 80s. Uh, the ethnic Koreans in Osaka uh, have worked on these issues for a long time and uh, uh, because the Jeju issue was a taboo uh, in Korea, until recently, until 1990s. So under the stringent dictatorship, uh, Korean people could not do anything about, could not repair the uh, past injustice. This is a special situation in Korea. And uh, here's the picture that uh, somebody already showed you, the, uh, the Jeju people were massacred. It's uh, quite similar like, uh, uh, Holocaust also. Uh, Jeju tragedy is called uh, Holocaust in, in the uh, uh, Orient. And uh, uh, this is a picture when the Taranshi cave uh, and the victims there in the cave was discovered uh, when the Professor Ko was the director of research institute. Uh, of every third tragedy, and uh, when he de decided to make open this uh, tragedy, according to his uh, junior scholar under the same mentor, he was almost killed. He was intimidated, and he he he, he could not stay in Jeju. He he had to hide himself in uh, in the in his mentor's house in Seoul. And this is the entrance of a Taranshi cave uh, and the exhibits of Taranshi victims uh, in those days. And uh, uh, oh. and uh, as many of you imagine, the, the historical uh, injustice uh, from the uh, Jeju tragedy several decades ago still continues. For example, the woman next to me, uh, second from the left, uh, her name is uh, uh, Yong Lim Cho, uh, who is uh, Professor Ko's student, but she could not become a government official as she had wished by the guild, uh, guild uh, by association. Uh, um, let's move to. Uh, uh, and think about the predicaments and challenges we are facing. We must understand predicaments confronting to us. The reality uh, is, um, wait a second, uh, that there has been no improvement whatsoever for, uh, to me, especially in terms of American responsibility. First, using a legislative approach, we have met with some uh, progressive members of Congress, such as Mark Takano, Judy Chu, in light of their efforts to raise awareness since 2015. However, those who understand our intentions are still limited. 
On the other hand, the Biden administration appears indifferent to the Jeju tragedy, as it is uh, only concerned with the contestation between the United States and China and the militarization of East Asia. This is a good example of the vicious cycles of hatred. And this is exactly the diamet diametrically opposed to a goal of peace islands, thoughts, and its related decade-long joint education. And secondly, uh, we, uh, we also held a UN Jeju meeting at the uh, UN headquarter building in New York uh, in the middle of 2019. Although um, I believe the conference was successful, there has been no reaction or response from the United States afterwards. Third, we launched negotiations with UNESCO uh, headquarter building in, in Paris in an attempt to have uh, the organization apply its various World Heritage programs to the Jeju tragedy. Uh, as uh, Professor Ko described uh, last year, uh, we took uh, Ms. O to UNESCO to, to ask her to, to make testimonies about uh, her past experience. She was a uh, uh, famous uh, diver and a tragedy survivor who had been inscribed as intangible cultural heritage. The entire UNESCO staff was happy to listen to a story. However, our negotiation efforts stalled by the Jeju government's apprehension about the US opposition. This is a picture taken at the UNESCO, uh, UN building and the center, uh, uh, you, you can notice uh, Miss Wanson Ko, um, and uh, she herself was almost killed, massacred at the tragedy of Book Jongli in January 1914. About four, uh, 400 uh, villagers, uh, villagers uh, are killed in a single night. Let's uh, analyze the Jeju government's uh, thoughts. I think this fear is unfounded because the Japanese government opposition, they mentioned Japanese government opposition uh, regarding the Nanshi massacre, but it is responsible. The, will United States government officials do the same? The United States is sens sensitive uh, to the human rights violations in Hong Kong, Uyghur, and Taiwan. This is the essence of conflict between the United States and China. As Professor Yamamoto emphasized, the reparations and reconciliation will serve as the core principles on which the legitimacy of a democratic society is founded. That This is, the, as uh, all of you know, that's a key point of his uh, monograph. He believes that these principles will serve as fundamental arguments when we attempt to persuade the United States to improve the stagnant situation about American responsibility. He's correct on this crucial point. Against this backdrop, will United States government officials ignore serious human rights violations in Jeju? If so, the United States position will be self-contradictory and the international community would lose faith in it. Therefore, this is why the, uh, this cautionary approach of the Jeju government is unfounded. And uh, last summer, I met with Wan Sun Ko uh, again uh, after some times uh, of COVID, and uh, she narrowly escaped, as I said, the Pukchoni massacre in January 1949, and provided compel compelling testimony at the 2019 UN conference. But she appeared frustrated about the recent situation. Uh, when she told me, there has been no change ever since I went to New York in 19, uh, 2019. 18 survivors died last year. We should make haste by all means, considering the age of many survivors, 
That's my perception uh, from a grassroots level empirical investigation. Regarding, uh, we should notice regarding her uh, request about American responsibility, she humbly told me that she only, uh, Miss Ko, only needed a sincere apology, not monetary compensation. We must ask the Biden administration to do so immediately as it is much less than uh, what the Clinton administration uh, did uh, for the native Hawaiians in uh, 1993, uh, as Professor Yamamoto interracial uh, justice described. And this is a uh, picture uh, at the uh, uh, Puk Xiong Li and the woman, uh, uh, the second person from the right is uh, Miss Kuo in her uh, community cafe. And uh, according to her, still after several decades uh, from, uh, from the tragedy, the many Jeju communities are divided, fragmented, and not many people uh, can communicate. Uh, communicate with each other. This is the reality. And uh, it's a hard issue how to attain the social healing for such situation, for such uh, villages. We are now entering the world of contestation in the 2020s, which is diametrically opposed to the world of detente in the 1990s when the Soviet Union was re restructured under Mikhail Gorbachev's leadership and hope for peace. Even the progressive Biden administration, on the other hand, uh, even the progressive Biden administration, which should be sensitive to human rights issues, has paradoxically increased global conflict, especially between the United States and China and related militarization, as well as along the Ryukyu archipelago across the heads of local peaceful indigenous people. To steer this invaluable reconciliation, social healing, legal scholarship, we must careful, carefully aware of this catch-22 predicament. The issue of the United States international responsibility is integral to the Jeju reparations and reconciliation, and it is strongly tied to the domestic Korean reparations. Nevertheless, this international dialogue has been stagnant over the past decade, despite our international efforts in many, many ways. To break the ice in this respect, Professor Yamamoto's peaceful solution from the grassroots level may be persuasive, but it may take time, during which most of Jeju tragic survivors may perish. Just like the successful uh, Jeju Kuram Novis uh, criminal, uh, cases on which uh, uh, Nats, Professor Nats Saito also uh, has written an article, a uh, good article, I, I, I uh, remember and uh, I recall. Uh, in the late 19, uh, 2010s, the Jeju in uh, late, late uh, 10, tw uh, 2010s as, uh, uh, is shown uh, by slides. And the uh, subsequent $4.4 million reparation in 2019 to over to, uh, 2,500 survivors and family members of those who were wrongly incarcerated remind us of the Fred Korematsu Koramnovis cases to which Professor Yamamoto himself was personally committed. The judicial approach towards American reparations notwithstanding its flaws may warrant reconsideration as a supplement to the legislative approach uh, pro Professor Yamamoto envisions for immediate awareness raising, uh, awareness raising among the American people in this deadlock situation. I believe on the other hand, the UNESCO and its various world heritage programs such as MOW, Memory of the World uh, program will play a more influential role for the time being in the future, at least with regard to the true historical education of the Jeju tragedy as a first step uh, in reconciliation process, as uh, uh, Professor Yamamoto shows us uh, by uh, his four hours. 
uh, recognition, uh, responsibility, uh, reconstitution, rep reparations. So UNESCO's role uh, is pretty much related to the first step, the recognition stage. Okay, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Sorry about my long talk. Thank you, Professor Yoshida, and thank you for joining us from Paris. And um, thank you for sharing this amazing um, presentation with us and your insight and experience. Uh, we are um, almost, we are running out of time. We are actually we did run out of time. And thank you, Professor Her, for handling the chat. We appreciate you. I will pass it to Professor Yamamoto to wrap us up and share some um, closing remarks, as well as ask our speakers um, a, a few questions. Thank you so much. I look forward to Professor Yamamoto's comments. <laughs> so thank you folks for being here, all of our wonderful speakers and contributors, as well as the audience. And I know we've run a bit long here, so I'll cut short my, my closing remarks. Uh, I'm proud to say it's, it's really wonderful to be here. And it's a very important time because the focus of my book was on Jeju and on its people and on healing the wounds of its people because we were asked to come there by them. And this book and all of the work revolves around that. Part of the healing part to get to the reconstruction and reparation where there really is an effect that the Jeju people can feel is not a matter of simply asking the US to, to acknowledge because it, we've done that and it, they won't do it. There's gotta be a strategic approach that leverages public consciousness raising and political and public pressure and it's gotta be coming from the public generally. So it's gotta be broader acknowledgement and recognition, which is part of what we're all doing, what my book is trying to do. It's gotta come from the inside. So it's getting key people in the house and especially the Senate, because the Senate is a small body that can exert political pressure inside. And then it's for people who can work with the White House who have connections to begin to get the word to why this is significant to the Biden administration that there's an interest convergence for the US to see that by showing that it abides by human rights uh, precepts of reparative justice to repair its own human rights harms, that it uplifts its stature as a democracy committed to the rule of law at a time when that is so significant. And these multifaceted strategies, and I, I kind of make to differ with Kenny, I agree with a lot of you, he says, my strategy is not legislative, it is multifaceted. And it operates on public consciousness raising in Korea to put pressure on the Korean government to put pressure on the United States. Without pressure from the Korean government, nothing will, will really happen. But it's got to come from the inside politically in the US. And that's got to come from a base of political awareness and consciousness raising. So that's why the multifaceted strategy. And I share the sense of urgency. And the people are old, and it breaks my heart. Um, and yet the pieces are beginning to fall into place. The setting aside of the convictions of 2,500 for ostensible rebellion existed during, or were arrested and convicted by military tribunals during Jeju 4.3. That occurred just a few years ago, part of the rejuvenated effort, part of seeing that the core of Japanese American core of Nova's cases, you can do it after the fact as part of a redress effort. Then there came an amazing ruling by that same judge awarding reparations to those people, but it wasn't everybody. And then through continuing struggle, the National Assembly awarded more broad scale reparations, even with gaps and, and, and missing pieces. And remarkably, the Korean police and the, the government agencies responsible directly, they apologized for the first time. So things are happening in a way that has kind of reached the Korean people that now gives the platform for reaching the American populace and the American policymakers. But it has to be a multifaceted attack. It cannot just be say it and ask for it. It's gonna fall flat as it has. So that's the approach that I've taken in and many others that I've talked to have advised that we take. And of course, a lot of it depends on what happens in the elections in three weeks and the kind of the political power and what the Biden administration can see as and it's gonna be in its interest. There needs to be some form of interest convergence to do the right thing for the Korean, for the Jeju people, but also in, that'll serve the interests of the United States. So I'd like to actually, since we're way over, to close by asking one question. And I'd like to ask it of uh, Professor Chang Hoon Ko. 
who, as Kenny said, has been the most instrumental person, I think, in my, my estimation in all of this, in risking his life, his career, to make this known, even in Korea, where people in Korea didn't know about what actually happened. And as several of our speakers said, we in the United States didn't know anything about the tragedy, let alone the US responsibility. So part of the first stage is recognition stage is still where a lot of it's at, even to get the years to accept responsibility. So my, my question I wanna pose to Professor Cole, and if you can close us up, really goes back to when you helped uncover the Daranchi cave, where a whole village was found slaughtered in the cave and, and covered up. And at that time, no one in Korea could even acknowledge the tragedy in the government's role and the US role. But it was Professor Cole and others who publicized it at great risk, and I think that transformed the consciousness, the recognition of what, what happened. And so Professor Ko, if you wouldn't mind closing us off by explaining a bit, telling us the story about your role in publicizing, finding and publicizing the Ranchi Cave and the wonderful and powerful impact that it had in changing public consciousness about what needs to be done to rectify the injustice. So I'll turn it over to you to close us off, or then to Elena to close us off after that. So Professor Ko, can you tell us about- All right, we are keeping here? going uh, to speak uh, truth to the power and uh, to the world. And uh, that's why uh, and uh, judge peace and the principle. Uh, we can keep on going. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ko. And on behalf of the Southwestern- Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, I need to add one thing. The, the Korean political situation seems to me has been changing after the governmental change. So that's why uh, Professor Cole was asked to cancel UNESCO uh, Jeju meeting. That's good examples. And uh, uh, without knowing uh, the political situation uh, in the United States, uh, and it might change uh, after the pub publication of uh, Professor Yamamoto's nice book, but they're too cautious, uh, too timid, and don't touch the th that thing. So their their attitude has been already <laughs> changing. So we need to to uh, break through this situation. And uh, I think Professor Ko uh, reject should reject such. Uh, uh, a cautious approach, and we should continue our, our efforts, I think. But how do you respond? <laughs> uh, Professor Erin Yamamoto and uh, I discussed with you know, how to handle you know, these issues. And so, uh, as we're planning on the next uh, and, uh, Washington DC you know, conference, uh, uh, whole point of conference. And uh, so, I, I agree, I, I, I accept, I just approach and you know, uh, cautiously. And uh, because of our political situation. As you know, in the United States also, you know, Democratic Party win, we can do just uh, to the proceed and you know, the more. Uh, <coughs> uh, but then, uh, so next year, you know, and March 20, we just uh, have a uh, celebration, a Korean territory and world peace. And of course, the, after that, uh, we have, we will have a, uh, and uh, change whole point to see and a uh, three D issues and a conference and uh, by as a, a kind of uh, a global uh, uh, world peace uh, global peace political assembly uh, uh, by youth people and uh, invite and uh, uh, Yamamoto and so on and so uh, that's my and uh, uh, strategy we can but and uh, we can keep going our effort and we can support, uh, that's my ideas. Okay, thank you. And I'll just quickly um, add to that and then we'll turn it over to Elena. The, the key word that Professor Ko just mentioned is strategy or strategic. It's not so much cautious or bold. It has to be strategic, calculated to get success because it can feel good to be bold, but if it's not, if it's gonna fail, it doesn't get you anywhere. So the key is how do we take the best strategic approach combining all the things that we know and all the kind of support that can be mustered to really achieve the goals that the people of Jeju really need and want. So Elena, thank you and thank you to everybody. I'll turn it back to you.
And with the Southwestern Law Review, we'd like to thank everyone present on this call to our phenomenal panelists today. Thank you for joining us and thank you for staying over time. We appreciate your time and you know your time is valuable, but we really appreciated your presentations and your experience and seeing your research. And only we believe that only through learning and action we can achieve change. So you are so appreciated. Thank you very much. And please feel free to survey to get the CLE credits. And thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Thank you very much. Thank um, you so much. Yeah. Congratulations again. Yeah. Pleasure. Pleasure.